And so when you read scripture, do you decline to imagine? Do you decline to picture? Do you decline to do any of that? And you shouldn't. You should yeah. be imagining it, but you should be trying to imagine it as accurately as possible, measured against what scripture gives you. But you should also know that other people are doing it better than you because they've got better imaginations. Other yeah. people are doing it worse than you because hopefully you're not the very last one on the bell curve. Like, right. But, but you are the worst person yeah. to ever imagine the Sermon on the Mount. But there is a worse person to yeah. ever do that. Yeah. You're the worst person to ever imagine the Exodus, the party of the Red Sea, to read right. that story and to not see it. I'm at hoping all. it's not this guy, but he's in danger. <laughs> but the, the fact is, we just we exist as narrative creatures in a narrative. It's how God speaks to us and how God it's how God created us. It's how he intends us to function. It's the only way that he gave us to function is via yeah. narrative and receiving words and information and then imagining. Met a ghost of a king on the road when I first fell. Fire burning to my knees, to my knees I fell. Met a ghost of a king on a road. I want to pretend like I don't know the episode number just for my daughter's sake, but it's 146, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to forget. Now yeah, it's super memorable. <laughs> <laughs> there you are, Lucia. <laughs> Welcome. To episode, episode 146. We're hoping you all enjoyed the discussion of Shawshank. I mean, I don't know that that's a true statement. I'm hoping you all enjoyed <laughs> the episode of Shawshank. I hadn't thought about it again. <laughs> I did. There was, I was, no, uh, there was no hope involved. Actually, I enjoyed the episode. That was really fun. So I do, true. in fact, now that you mention it, I do hope everybody enjoyed that because I enjoyed it. It was fun. I mean, we're only going to do more. Well, and I think it reminded clips. me that I need to keep chipping through the rock walls and slithering through the sewers just to get to that creek. Yeah. Yep. So that's my plan. Yep. Keep on. Keep chipping. Just keep chipping. <laughs> Okay. That'll be another. What are we talking about today, Brian? Today we've today we've got a couple a couple questions. Oh, so good. inspired by your discussion of Boys in a Boat <clears throat> and how much better the book was. Yeah. Uh Luke asks as uh, this question, well, okay. As an author, would it irk you to have a film adaptation of one of your books be changed to the point that it's something completely different? Uh Walter Kern told me that when in a moment of I think great wisdom <laughs> All you care about is that they don't change the title. Mm. That's it. That's it. Book okay. sales. Because book sales happen. Because what you want is for people to experience the original, to experience the book. And if the movie onboards people into that book, if the Boys in the Boat movie pushes book sales and more people come around and read the book than they would have otherwise, then that's a net plus. Mm -hmm. So uh, for him, that book was up in the air right. and a George Clooney adaptation which he said they changed you know everything and he was just really hoping they wouldn't change the title <laughs> just don't change the title and just they don't have it based on the book that you know, that yeah something where completely different so you think about the, the worst Walter example Curry. of this was slumdog millionaire right where people don't know that was based on a book yeah uh based on quiz show you know based on the novel quiz show I right think it was. or jojo rabbit yeah yeah but that book I hear is not great. Yeah. So it's like based on an idea, based on the book. But you you get that separation and it's like the book doesn't exist at all. And you don't push more people to that reading experience. And so I would mostly be bothered if they changed the title. I Basically, I think I've absorbed that wisdom from Walter. Nice. So the, the question is just move, making a movie as a marketing Mo uh, money play that can lead to yeah. the books and it has to be different. I think you've said that several times is that adaptations totally. of movies must be different than books. And let's say from the author's perspective, let's say here's the worst thing ever that could be said, which is, Oh, that's way better than the book. Yeah. No, you know what you don't want is that what you want is everybody saying the book's better. Mm. The book's better. Oh, you oh, should, true. Read, you should true. read the book. The book's the book's better. Yeah, if you liked this flavor, you get a whole And meal. so, for for example, I, I've heckled Lord of the Rings movie fans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but none of them are my actual enemies. We're all just inside fandom of Lord of the Rings. Like, we're just different levels of fan of the same thing. We are better levels than they are. Yeah. I happen <laughs> to be the club level. <laughs> um, you no, all we have the freemium we have, tier. We're all, we are ads. all fans. We are all fans <laughs> right. of this world, this creation, these characters, this story. So we're all fans of what Tolkien built. We're all fans of that. The instant somebody says, 
the movies are better than the books, then we're at war. We're not all on the same team mm -hmm. anymore. But every real movie, every real fan of the movies that I know personally that it, uh, that I can think of right now, mm -hmm. no one would say that. Yeah, they, they all, all like the movies, and they might defend aspects of the movies and aspects of the adaptation against me. But that's they say, fine. Sure, the we disagree about right. the adaptation, and there's right. ad, there's adaptation choices that had to be made, and we can disagree about those. But we can agree that adaptation choices had to be made. Um, a lot of people are mad that Bombadil isn't included. I think there's a strong case to be made that Bombadil should not have been included. I would have tried to, but there's a strong case to be made. That he would have been ruined no matter how you did it. It would have, well, it would have just pace killer, et cetera. It would have, in a three act like thing that's trying to move, it would have been uh, a, a problem um, for a theatrical structure. But the point is, we could have all those arguments intramurally, and we all enjoy the source material much more than we enjoy the films. For those people that start to turn the film into the source material and start to give the films uh, some kind of hierarchy above the books, I think that's where we're wildly at odds. Um, and so I, I think that is kind of the case for a lot of things. So does anybody like the Narnia movies that were made by Walden Media? Yeah, some people do. Does anybody maintain they're better than the books? Yeah, not one. I they, think they should be certified. If anybody maintained that, they it's that's a cert certifiable right. claim. And so you, you don't want that. Now, if the book has inadequacies, that have, which books can... And the movie corrects those inadequacies and tells a better story, or the, uh, a film was a better medium to tell a particular story, then great. Yeah. It's not, you know, the movie could be better. Movies could be better than the book. It's possible. But the two things that I would care about for film adaptation of my works are keep the title, and I'd rather it not be better than the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you think authors who, I mean, uh, you think an author who tries to get a, a line item in there of like, I have to, you know, I have to approve this cut or something. That's delusional. For for an author, for a movie to say like, I have to approve. I think it's ridiculously stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Because you think authors are a different world. Or is that authors are a different world. Movie people know their business or at least are different enough that you're not worried that say someone produces a version of Dragon's Tooth that kind of stinks. I would want it to be good. Yeah. Okay. So you I would want it to be good, but if it was like eh, you know, it was, you know, a B plus, it's still a massive net positive mm -hmm. uh in terms of driving book sales and readership and fandom and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it would be I mean, I th I think I've had one one hundred coverage has been all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been at Disney. Uh twice like eight years apart <laughs> you know, it's, and when you say it's been there you mean it's been talked about meaning there. i've I've received checks gotcha. like where okay. it's like okay so Option, i'm receiving optioning stuff. optioned extended yeah. options etc like right, I've, right. they're paying they're keeping my lights on uh over at amazon you know it's been mm -hmm. it's been over here and over there and over there you know it's been with amblin and it's been with disney uh, studios proper it's been with producers that have deals at disney it's been uh with disney plus so one was pre-disney plus disney disney theatrical uh then also disney plus it might still be with disney it could still end up with disney right um and in all of this what i've learned is do you know it'd be great it'd be great if somebody wanted to actually make this movie i mean <laughs> like op option so you're the not sitting there being like here are the obstacles the director must jump over in order to make this movie for me and make me no. happy you're just like what no, can i, I do I mean, to I, let's, grease let's, the skin let's not <laughs> let's not uh, tell lies here i am a total problem when it comes to um <laughs> the adaptation and like their perspective and what they want to do and there's you know, back when Cupboards was released, there was plenty of marginalia from editors that were con concerned about gender roles and, you know, and not being traditional Americana and being more subversive and how do we do this? Um, but at the same time, so basically there'd be plenty for me to fight about. Uh, but at the same time, I want, I want the show made. And so I'm less concerned about will the cinematography be Roger Deakins level? I'm not going to get yeah. all precious about this. It needs to be amazing and just be like, is it going to be fun? Yeah. Could we make this fun? Right. Like if we hit this is fun, I'd be thrilled. Yeah. 
that'd be that'd be fantastic. So one thing I've heard. This I'll also say as a side note, yeah, this not to be too distracting, but I have plenty of people who assume um, they make a Northern European white assumptions because we're in a we're in a fantasy. They assume that these kids are Swedish, um, sure, and they're not. Yeah, you know, it's like that's and so it's also really funny that if. I'm talking to Disney and I'm like, Hey, actually it'd be great if like me creatively, totally apart from any woke, Mm -hmm. anything, any of the leftist movements, it would be funny for me to be in a position of saying, Hey, can we push, can we, you know, can we push them darker? Can we not have a blonde? Can we have, right. You know, I want these, this kid's from another world. He's from another world. And in my head, there's very specific backstory lineage I'm like trying to remember your description of the groups. city. It's more like Turkey or old Spain. And so right? Frank yeah. and Henry are not from here. They're not, yeah. you know, they're they're not descended from Germans. Um, it's a very different thing. And so it's it's funny to have that. I know that if I were pushing that and that came out, I know there'd be fans being like, hey, they're doing the little mermaid things. Like yeah, the woke thing. Yeah, yeah, it's not, and that would not be the case. It would just be trying to get people to think outside of their assumptions about different worlds and all, you know, alternate places. And so when you get over to where he's from, you know, in Hilfing and, uh, and where he originated, uh, it's not, you know, it's not Swedish. It's not Northern European that way. Anyway, back to your point. Well, my question was in her saving Leonardo book, Nancy Piercy starts off with a story of how Hank, the cow dog, the show totally nuked the traditional family, you know, made, Sally, you know, removed the dad from the situation and made right. Sally kind of the farm, the, the, the farm owner. And, um, she uses that as a sign of how Christians get worked in, in popular entertainment. But, um, from what I'm hearing, you're saying there may be another side to this, that perhaps part of the immense popularity of Hank, the cow dog, the fact that there are 60 books is because there is a TV show. Yeah. And that if he'd thrown down and said, no, no, there's gotta be traditional family nothing would have happened. There wouldn't have been a show and so on. Interesting. Um, now with, with hello ninja, it wasn't like we were not in, there was no big vision wars, right? Mm -hmm. We made four seasons of that show. There were plenty of funny conversations and funny moments. Uh, but I really enjoyed the team. I really enjoyed the, uh, various perspectives and so on, but there were conversations, there were plenty of conversations that came up of like, we want uh, pivots in the character. So let's, and this is more in development. Like the dad is a stay at home dad and a bit of a fraidy cat. Mom is this aggressive executive, you know, out there killing the Buffalo. And that was just something I pushed really hard against. And it was not something that I pushed hard against in a way that, cause big fights it was more just like this matters to me but there were other people who were pushing the other direction they weren't pushing out of like a deep need to have it be that way it was in in many ways it was them just pushing to be more reflective of reality and so Mm. they were they were pushing towards kind of like mainstream family culture and i was pushing away from mainstream family culture. I was like, Hey, let's do, I want to do something more traditional. And so what we ended up with was dads and, you know, dad's an architect. He runs a, he's running this business out of his garage. And so there's, there's stories of the cat getting into all his mm-hmm. stuff, but it turns out, you know, it's like, it wasn't the cat wasn't yeah. the kids going to solve the mystery, but he's, he's working out of his house. He's a self-employed, you know, architect with his shop attached. Um, and mom is, we don't know what everything mom's doing. Mom's mom, which is a great mom. Um, and so we basically just didn't wade into, we didn't wade into what exactly was going on other than we did not dogmatically push a dad as a whiny weak figure for these kids. Sure. Um, but at the same time, the people who thought like, hey, let's have dad be complaining. Let's have dad be stay at home and mom strong. No one was suggesting that out of some you know, agenda driven thing. It was more just their creators and they look around at the world around them. And this is kind of what kids are dealing with right dang, now. So dang, 
And so <laughs> I don't like that, but that, that really that, was the true, case. Yeah. I was not. So when I was saying, Hey, let's go this way. Nobody was angry at me. Nobody was vicious. I was just trying to pull this way. Um, in a way that's like more reflective of my family and what I do and where this book came from. Um, I work out of wherever, you know, I work out of my head sitting in the dark in my house. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's right. That's what I do. But the, on the flip side, I think a lot of people do overly project in intentionality and malice to moves that are just the fruit growing on the tree. Mm. You know, it's not the fruit trying to change the tree. It's just a manifestation of the tree. And so we get into entertainment and it's like, oh, this story has this. Here's this bad thing. It's like, okay, is it a great tree? If only we hadn't grown this on it. Um, and people have that. I see this now in conservative, um, conservative culture. I think everybody does. When you see conservatives being like, we need pinup magazines like the olden days. Yeah, we need uh, swimsuit calendars of conservative girls to hang up in conservative mechanic right. shops. It's like, what's wrong with you? That's how we got here. Right. That's that's just further up the branch of the same tree. Or the weird praise of Sydney Sweeney dressing crazily just because she's dressing like a woman, you know, right. and where you know that sort of thing, pretending like that is some sort of reversal or, yeah. or return to yeah. So g going towards pinups. And so when I was con transferring to some of my, my grandfather's uh, eight millimeter Korean war footage um, to digital for my extended family and I was going, going through all these. And then there was one like section where there's all these different pilots on the airstrip are all painting nose art on their bombers. Right. And um, it was really, it, it was funny. Yeah. Because some of it was like, woo. Like, okay, mm -hmm. wow, all right. And some of it was like, it's Tom and Jerry. Right. Well, like my grandpa, he, he I remember he was in Australia and he traded, he didn't drink. So he traded his whiskey ration to get Bugs Bunny on the end, eating a carrot because night fighters ate yeah. carrots for their eyes. But everybody else you're looking at has extremely busty cartoons. Yeah, yeah, all, all and over worse. The, yeah. <laughs> um, there was one that was so graphic that these people were painting on the side of their plane that my grandfather... Went past it, and then he came back later, and somebody, I don't know if it was him, um, had made them censor it. Oh, wow. And so, like, these guys are going into war. <laughs> like, this is these are as piratical. They're going to go defy death. It was kind of like uh, no holds barred in what you're painting on the nose of your plane. I mean, it was, it was a little bit just free and easy, and not those guys. Those guys yeah. uh, had a little censored bar. Um thrown over the top of it. And I was like, yeah, good, good. I'm glad <laughs> it was good. But then I think I'm still tracking all this back, but my grandfather's was called the outlaw and had just a like fully clothed, pretty lady just mm -hmm. on the side. I don't know why she was the outlaw. I don't know if it was intended to be my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Like it may have been, I'm not sure. Yeah. So it seems to me like it might've been, my grandmother, they were trying to paint on the side by his cockpit because he was he was the pilot. But right, um, it's just very uh, nautical to yeah. To have, it was have and it was, but it was craft. obviously yeah. it was a far classier thing. Yeah, than some of his uh, fellow pilots. But anyway, the point is, the point is now we have a bunch of people who want to go back to like if only we could get the American culture back to 1990s Playboy. Yep. And it's like, you are idiots. If only we could get this back to, you know, ring girls, ring mm. girls in the eighties and boxing matches. Like, that's what we want. It's like, no, yeah. it's not. It's not what we want. What we want to do is stop sexualizing and exploiting women, period. And then from there, sexualizing and exploiting literally everything under the sun, which is, right. you know, we've done since. So when you come to storytelling, you watch a movie in Hollywood, it can be a problem. You can see something and you can say like, ah, I don't like this. I like, that's yeah, gross. Disney has a trend that's toward bad. weak dads. That's yeah. bad. Mm, that's bad. Mm, right. That's bad. And you can like, I don't like this, but it's because you don't like the tree. This yeah. is the fruit on the tree. And if you just threw the fruit away, the tree doesn't actually change. And so you're saying you actually could have, or and do have things that you, you know, would be like, if I were in my family, I would rather not have it this way, but you'd be fine with it happening in a mainstream adaptation. 
or, or um, there's lines, screen. you know, there's lines and there's lines that it would have to cross. It could cross where I'd be like, you know, that's unfortunate. Right. I have, uh, I mean, I think we talked about this before too, where we were saying, yeah, Christians have to be willing to work with other people and yeah. you guys are not, you know, we are not people who are hard to work with. So across was, lines. here's this, like the, the 100 cupboards, audiobooks. I couldn't listen to them. Everything was wrong. Mm. This is my words. Exactly. But everything was wrong. Mm. And it's like, Oh no, you missed it. Like, no, the sisters are, they're not brats. They're not angry. They're not bitter. They're, this is banter. They're having like, there's wow. affection. Can you get, please get more affection in there. And I've heard from plenty of people who are fans of the books who love the audio books, have no problem with it. Didn't, didn't pick up any of that mm. at all. I'm just grateful the dude did it. He's a great voice actor. I'm glad Listening Library released it. I'm grateful for the whole thing. But I didn't actually listen or go through it because it all I could hear was, that's incorrect. That's not, that's, I was just directing, mm. um, which is not, you know, not the best, not great. So I could, I can imagine a show being like that, a movie being like that. Sure. Where you're like, where, I can't watch it. Is every episode of Hello Ninja exactly the way I wanted it? No, of course not, because I wasn't in charge of every single phase. And at the same time, I don't know. I'm agnostic about a bunch of it in terms of it wasn't my job. Yeah. I didn't go look at the options. Well, if that's you how know? a team, you would assume that right. they actually made it better than you could have made it if in right. some, in some yeah, ways. Yeah, so, in so many ways. Yeah, right. So many ways. The showrunner, the director, like all these people achieved things I could not have achieved. And if I were given a, a set of multiple choice questions for every single de decision they made, would I have made all the exact same decisions? No, I'm sure. Cause we're different people mm -hmm. and we have different yeah. perspectives. So I was thrilled with hello ninja and the points of conflict that we had were there was one where I, I dropped the ball. I missed stuff for a while. They, I, I, I had like a, a couple opportunities. I could have caught it earlier. I delegated ineffectively. And then I circled back around and was like, wait, why are they praying to their ancestors? Why are the kids okay. doing an ancestor worship thing? How did this happen? When did this happen? Like, where did this go? And I went back a couple iterations and it, like, I just missed it. Mm. And so I kind of like, I talked to the, everybody executing. It's like, I just don't want this. I don't want this. Like we got to not have this. And that was a screw up because it cost the production more money because mm. I missed it early, but nobody... Like, it was fine. I mean, this was my show. Yeah. So right. I had the ability to say, we're not doing, Yeah. you know, we're not doing that. Let's not do that. Then I knew that I was putting everybody out. It was a problem that I was doing this at the phase of, in, you know, where we were. We were all the way into animatic, and I, I missed it in script. Uh, I'd missed it in the boards. So because I'd handed that off, I'd handed that review off elsewhere and then had not delegated effectively. Uh, by the time I caught up, it, it caused this disruption in that episode, and we had to mm. uh, we had to eat some cost to change it. Um, if that and that was not like they didn't right they did not throw down, mm. and they could have because it was my mistake in right. terms of timing, and it would have just gone out that way. Right, and how would you have handled that? This just I would have had to just say, was yeah, that was my mistake. Like I just right. missed that in review. Right. You know, it's like, I would not have wanted to right. throw a bunch of people under the bus. Sure. Um, so I was really grateful that we were able to correct it, but that kind of thing is just going to happen. And I'm, I want to control the quality as much as I can. I especially want to control worldview as much as I can, but there are plenty of times when we get angry at the fruit and we haven't bothered to think about the root and what's actually going on. Mm. Um, so it's and yeah, it's cyclical because you 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 should get bothered by a lot of it. The weak dad thing. You should mm -hmm. not want to do that. You should not want to reinforce that because it does kind of cyclically come back around and catechize the kids that this is normal and this is expected, and mm -hmm. and then it continues to produce more of that story, that you know, type of story, and it just kind of revolves. But it's not always, you know, it's not. In fact, frequently, it's not malicious at all. It's just an outworking of the tree that exists, that is our culture. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there it is. We need, we need to go further back if we're going to, gotcha. if we're going to change it. Uh, following up on this one, another question. 
more observation. Uh, Gavin Ortland had tweeted an interesting observation about fiction, and it said, what work of fiction changed your worldview the most? His is Till We Have Faces. Um, which, Weird, okay. Which we've done an episode on. But then another pastor followed up and said, none. No work of fiction should ever change our worldview. As a Christian, my worldview is shaped by Scripture alone. And it caused a bit of a... I thought I'd just get Nate's hot take on... Should we be shaped by till we have faces or shaped by scripture alone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I think you know the answer, Brian. That's called um, a, that's called a bifurcation where you separate into <laughs> two unacceptable options. Yeah. <laughs> and force Nate to say something that you can then clip and put on the end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Perfect. Perfection. Um to kick against fiction is just I don't even know how people start. I don't know. Like there's a lot of positions I can assume the devil's advocate position and try to defend, but that one is just not, yeah. it's just not defensible at any level. So, and, and most specifically, it's kind of like kicking against Psalms. Say like we should never, ever be affected by Psalms. So it's like, you do know that there's Psalms in the Bible, right? Yeah. Um, kicking against storytelling and fiction. It's like, you do realize there's a lot of fiction in the Bible. There's a lot of fiction in the Bible. There's a lot of stories told in scripture. Mm -hmm. And apparently they don't. Apparently they don't know that. Yeah, there's that weird category between, oh, this is a parable. I have a, a Bible name for it. So it doesn't count as a story. Or and also to me, just the delusion that you could only be shaped by scripture alone. Like that there's this category of right. here. I don't I, I don't exist in culture at yeah, all. Yeah, like I yeah. grew up I grew up never being told a story without the family I am. In fact, I'm just this until the Bible was inserted into me, you know, I I acted completely neutral. I never played cowboys and Indians in the backyard. I never did any imagining. I never did any of that ever. Mm. Uh is ludicrous. So yeah, we will we will be shaped by self narrative, we'll be shaped by stories parents tell us, we'll be shaped by Stories we're told about our grandparents, which are, in fact, abbreviations and adaptations. And, in fact, uh, sometimes outright falsehoods. Yeah, we yeah. Find later. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to be shaped by those things. And just that's how it is. Yeah. So let's put it this way. If, if a guy like that found out on the last day that the book of Job was literature only. Mm. If he found out that that was fiction, his whole worldview would get rocked and shaken because for him, fiction by definition cannot be true. Right. For me, fiction can be true. So if I found out that Job was fiction, I would be surprised. Right. You were looking forward to talking with Job. Yeah, I would be, <laughs> I would be surprised. Uh, and at the same time, my worldview would not shake. Also, I would wonder how I missed that. I would, I would, because uh, I, I don't think it is. Right. Like, you know, you'd, it's you'd not. also be looking for the novelist. Yeah. You'd be like, who, like, who who's, wrote, okay, okay, who's, who wrote and, this? Because where, who wrote the story? And this is now the earliest version of written fiction ever anywhere. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's momentous in a different, in a different way. But, the truth of it, the truth of the book of Job is not, is not in dispute. Mm -hmm. And so he would be the one more likely to lose his faith after a discovery like that. And I would be just surprised that I'd been so wrong, <laughs> you know, where it's, yeah. but I'd been wrong before. So it's not, it's not that giant thing. No, I, I happen to think that it's historical. It's literary and historical. Uh, I don't think this is like a whole cloth fictional narrative. I think it's a true Narrative. The whole thing's true. It's all God breathed. Mm -hmm. You know, Second Timothy three sixteen. All that. Yeah. Uh, and that does not preclude Parts the, the fact it. that it could be a story. Being now, fictional. just the same way that Christ told stories, that Nathan the prophet told a story to David. Yeah, I was going to bring up the Nathan the prophet. It made me wonder if this guy actually is is just glossing over his weakness in that he thinks fiction when he can see. Because like Nathan the prophet, he knows yeah. he can find the truth of that story. He's like, right. oh, I'm supposed to interpret it's it in this you, way. It's you, David. Yeah, it's you. I've got the code. 
And I think he's actually showing right there with his color that he, you know, he's showing the colors of, hey, I don't know how to interpret a story. Like that's actually the fundamental weakness. And that's yeah. why he's afraid of it. Because when you, he'd say, oh yeah, I know how to interpret Jesus's stories. I've got the black and white answer. You know, the seed is the word of God. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and to me that also seems like a pretty naive take for Jesus's parables as well. Yeah. But, but also thinking about the dreams that Joseph interprets. Mm. Think about the narrative dreams that are given as visions that are fiction. You know, they're, they're in the imagination. And so we've got the starving cows, we've got the, the stone and the statue. Um, and then I would say we've got the entire book of revelation, which is more like abstract art. Yeah. A lot of it is just stacks of really complex and intricate imagery. I mean, in his definition, it's not true. Right. Like there is not. And, a but man. a lot of a lot of fundies drift into that literal, precise uh, interpretation of Revelation that they will it will come and look exactly like this, yeah. as opposed to layers of symbols and images and uh, right. and all these things. So I I think that yeah, this is the revelation. This is the vision historically that was given, but the vision that was given is a complex tangle of really really shocking and striking imagery yeah uh, and narrative scenes does the, he really have a sword in his mouth you know it, are they really grasshopper heads yeah <laughs> and i and i tails. think the in the vision yeah i think a yeah. sword came out of his mouth in the vision right but that's fiction the vision itself is is fictional and true so right you know i i think that it's a really shallow understanding of what fiction is to be flippant like that. Um, if you said the same thing of vampire novels, I might be with you. you got really specific, <laughs> but yeah. uh, no vampire fiction should ever change our world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> but nothing fictional, like nothing fiction. What do we mean? No fictional imagery, nothing like is allegory. Okay. Is, I mean, I think he means cre like nothing creative. I, these are people who view the Bible as a. These chunk are people of who are, let's just say that. I'll I'll throw this out here. I tease people about this sometimes. I'm like, listen, get away from any kind of analytical philosophy. Get away from uh, modernist thinking, and try to be more like Solomon. Just try to be Solomonic. Try to add, not remove. Stop trying to get to essences and minimalistic communication down to ones and zeros. And add more, more context, more narrative, more flesh. Um, build. Sure, Ecclesiastes. Find it does seem like it's a fictional skill to be able to say life is vapor, and do your best with it because it's great. You know. Yeah. Also, you know, life isn't vapor. Yeah. Not literally. Sure. Like that's a it's a that's sure. a creative expression. It's a metaphor, which is the act of fictionalizing. That is the work of the imagination there to say life is vapor to say god is a rock is fiction and it's true mm -hmm. he is he's more of a rock than a rock is you yeah. know it's like it's yeah. he's he's christ is the way he's a door <laughs> you know right um and and so on and there's this literalism and a a one to one uh extreme analytical impulse that varies in different personalities and different branches of christendom they want it to be math. They want it to be mathematical. They don't want it to be human and incarnational. Sure, I want they, to put the truths and falses underneath. They don't want every part any. Of the story. Yeah, but they also yeah. don't want any part of a metaphor to be a to be false. But every single metaphor has parts of it that are false. Mm. Like God is not a, a rock or a mother hen, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's not. But apparently he is. Yeah, you know, it's like it's. But there's ways in which he isn't. So in that metaphor, there are ways in which God is not a rock. He's not granite. You know, he's not igneous. He's not sedimentary. He's not metamorphic. You know, it's like it's, these are things he isn't, but he is a rock. Mm -hmm. Metaphorically speaking, that's a true statement. Christ is not a door, but he is more profoundly a door than doors are. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's, there's, but there's so many ways he doesn't have hinges. He doesn't have a knob. It's like there's, right. <laughs> there's all these ways in which he's not a door. Metaphors always fail 
they're always works of fiction and they're always works of fiction in microcosm, but they also always communicate the truth to some greater or lesser degree, depending on how skillful the creator is in communicating. So uh, Solomon's quite skillful. And he's talking about flesh is grass and life is vapor and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. It's all creative writing. That's creative writing. Yeah, that powerful section at the end of Ecclesiastes when he talks about dying, you know, yeah. when the grinders yep. cease from, I don't remember what he says, but I, I should memorize it. It's one of those <laughs> things where you just, you do feel Solomon in full flow. As And again, we don't know that Solomon wrote it. <laughs> Maybe we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure he did. Uh, pretty sure he did, but we'll see. Yeah. And the it's, it's interesting. So to try to assert that, about fiction generally is to misunderstand the way human beings function. The fact that we are characters inside of a story and that our medium is narrative. It is fiction that you cannot. And here's, here's something for you. When you see, when you see things, when you hear things, when you taste things, when you feel things, you have senses, which for us means you have contact or supposed contact with something that is distilled down into words, electrical communication, which is then sent to your imagination and read. And then you picture it and then you imagine the smell of it. Mm -hmm. Like you receive the information via electrical signals, via flesh cables yeah. And then you conjure up the image. Right. And so every single thing about how we exist and how we function, it's all narrative. It's all story. All of it. Sure. So you're saying you're you're kind of pushing on what the philosophers have argued about. Like our eyes are not actually capturing what is out there. That distinction between what's out no, there. they are. Or but or, actually capturing them sure. means receiving the light signals distilling it down and sending electrical signals to your brain. Right? right? Right. So those electrical, the way we are biologically made is that we send electrical signals to the brain, which receives the electrical signals and then follows the instructions. Yeah. You know, like, and then conjures up a rendering mm. in your mind, but it's not the thing. Yeah. It's the rendering in your mind. Yeah, and, and it's intricate, it's amazing, it's phenomenal, it's miraculous. I love it. And yet it is also still, even inside your own biology, breaking down to narrative that is read and interpreted. Like just inside receiving any of your impulses and then like drawing conclusions based on that. Oh, that's that's kind of how it breaks down. And it's super cool and it's way more complicated way more complex than that. But at the same time, <laughs> We, we live in stories. We are running around between the lines on the page. This is the, the water in which we swim. This is how it works. We're meant to do this. Yeah. We're meant to read the Gospels and picture a scene. And because we're not relativists, there's a whole bunch of, well, there's a big giant bell curve of all of humanity who've ever read the Sermon on the Mount and pictured it. Yeah. And there's a bell curve of accuracy. Yeah, nearer and farther from how <laughs> yeah. it was. How many people actually got pretty close to picturing it right. the way it was? And how many people were on the saw ben, a blonde we just Mormon standing we over Salt Lake City? We, were just, we just watched Ben-Hur and we're marveling. You know, they don't show Jesus' face yeah. ever, but they do show his beautifully combed hair. <laughs> <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, so are you are you on the Ben-Hur scale? <laughs> yeah, where are, where are you? And so when you read Scripture... Do you decline to imagine? Do you decline to picture? Do you decline to do any of that? And you shouldn't. You should yeah. be imagining it, but you should be trying to imagine it as accurately as possible, measured against what Scripture gives you. But you should also know that other people are doing it better than you because they've got better imaginations. Other yeah. people are doing it worse than you because hopefully you're not the very last one on the bell curve. Like Right. But, but You are the worst person yeah. to ever imagine the Sermon on the Mount. But there is a worse person to yeah. ever do that. Yeah. You're the worst person to ever imagine the Exodus, the party of the Red Sea, to read right. that story and to not see it. I'm at hoping all. it's not this guy, but he's in danger. <laughs> <laughs> but the the fact is, we just 
We exist as narrative creatures in a narrative. It's how God speaks to us and how God, it's how God created us. It's how he intends us to function. It's the only way that he gave us to function is via yeah. narrative and receiving words and information and then imagining. Yeah, our family was noticing all the differences in how the different gospels tell the Easter story. Right. Like which details are focused on. Like, does he say both, you know, and, and you're harmonizing it so that it's not contradictory, but like, are both thieves yelling at Jesus or just one thief? The answer has to be both. And then one repented, right? Because <laughs> one of them was like, yeah, I want mockers and I want a repenting, mm -hmm. you know, and one's like, I want to focus on repentance. And then same thing with how many donkeys were there. You know, is there a mom donkey and a baby donkey? And I saw an interesting, fascinating thing about how they would actually probably bring a mother donkey alongside the baby donkey that's never been rode, never been ridden road. There's my Southern Idaho coming out um, no. <laughs> into Rodent. the city. Yeah, yeah. Never been because, you know, just all those details are highlighting different gospel or, 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 or was it a mule? Hmm? I guess I don't know. What are the limits? Where, <laughs> where, like how accurate is our conception? Yeah. That's actually, you true. know, right. What, what did this look like? And the thing is funny is you see, you see the Kings writing the aristocrats riding on mules, the Kings, you know, earlier in the old Testament. Right. And it's like, was this a step further? Like coming in on a donkey? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really, but how do you picture it? How yeah, do you, and I the way people picture Palm Sunday, the way people picture sure. the trial, we all picture all these things. And or is the crowd the same crowd? I remember your dad saying that too, of just like, is the crowd that cheered him the crowd that then yeah. condemned him? And your dad was arguing from a lot of narrative, like, no, these are separate crowds. But the blocking, the the actual blocking in the scene with Pilate would also be really interesting. Sure. Meaning like, where is Pilate sitting? What is his body language? What's his posture? Where does he move? Where's when he washes his hands, where does he go? What's yep. going on? Is he turning his back to Christ? What is what is what is he doing? How is he yeah. looking at him? Like yeah, it was fascinating um, to watch Ben Hur do that. You know, watch yeah, one you're, of the greatest you directors to choices. With all those people just trying to set. Yep. And yeah. you got to make those choices. And God gives us what he gives us. And then we have to picture. But I talk about this. I probably talked about this in the podcast before, but I've hammered rhetoric students this way. I, I know I talked about this on the podcast, but I'm going to do it again. If I say Sam and Frodo were being chased by orcs down a hill. Yeah. Like, okay, everybody, I want you to picture something. Picture Sam and Frodo being chased by orcs down a hill. Everybody positions a camera, like mm -hmm. where, where they go. So are you at the bottom of the hill and Sam and Frodo are coming towards you and the orcs are behind them? That was me. Are you on the side of the hill watching them run past? Sam and Frodo are running down. Orcs are, you know, behind them. Are you with them? Are you in? The are you doing crowd? handheld camera oh, work where you're actually running with Sam and Frodo and you're looking back over your shoulder at the orcs coming? Are you with the orcs? Yeah, Uruk High Mode, Peter Jackson. Like, are you coming over chasing the the hobbits? What's your angle? And from which side of the hill are you looking? And from you know, like, what's the angle? There's almost infinite variation. If I just say Sam and Frodo being chased by orcs down a hill, the camera placement, the drone shot, the like, all the stuff. Yeah, that, and that's just angle of looking at the thing. And then there's <laughs> lensing and exposure. And then I might say you're on the left side, but are you left side bottom? Are you one inch higher than that? Are you two inches higher than that? Are you three inches higher than that? I mean, we could go all the way around. And in a dome, you know, it's like there's yeah. there's so much creativity to what you could do trying to picture Sam and Frodo being chased by orcs. And this is, this is the ultimate... Um, refutation of a lot of analytical thinkers and people who think that fiction doesn't communicate and only, only precision and distillation communicates. I could run through all this. We could have all these conversations. And then I could say, how many orcs were there in your mental image? Like how many? What, what would you say yours was? I mean, in the actual shot. In your, when, when I said Sam and Frodo being chased by orcs down a hill, how many orcs were there? 40. 40. Did you count them? No. No, so you have no idea. Right. Right? I'm just guessing. You have a re you have a representative mass. <laughs> yeah. And you don't even have I guarantee you if you're picturing a mob like that, you might have maybe one individual right. orc that you pictured. Right. You pictured an impression of this big threatening mass. Yeah. A big or like an organic hole mm -hmm. that was orcs. Now, if I 
asked every single listener, how many did you picture? Like it'll vary. Right. I mean, it's just going to vary a lot. Um, and if I said picture two, everybody could picture two, picture three orcs chasing Sam and Frodo picture four picture seven. Yeah. As soon as you're up, as soon as you're kind of moving towards five and above people move into blob imagination, they move into Van Gogh impressionism. And it's like, it's right. We're just impressionistically sweeping a brush over there for how many orcs there are, because we can't count and hold those individuals <laughs> in our head. Then we're not going to quickly distill seven different personalities and shapes and then keep track of them in one image in our head. So we just mm -hmm. kind of, yeah, just wave of the orcs. And then, then you move into the storytelling and scripture and the numbers that get thrown at us and like how much we're just being like, Bleh. like right. there was 5,000, like there's just big hand wave over there. The imagination just blends it all. And so if we come back to the nature of uh, nonfiction communication, to refute this. It's still fictional. Yeah. Think of Deuteronomy telling you, talk to your kids about what you've been through yeah. at all times. Like just the ability of telling a family story. Yeah. That's hard. Like Ex trying to, exactly. trying to communicate to your kids that God's great deliverance and your kids aren't getting it. They're just like, right. Oh, you, actually dad, you did a bad job explaining that. Didn't sound that cool. If you, <laughs> if you get into the Valley of Elah and you're doing the David and Goliath story, the amount of crab walking and shuffling that's happening across all that, like all that maneuvering between the Philistines and, mm. uh, and the Israelites is really weird and hard to picture. Mm. And then you start to map it and chart it and figure it out and try to find the motivation for it. And you can, mm. you can, but you're talking takes, about their 40 days of, yeah, of shuffling. one guy coming out and shouting. Yep. And, yeah. And then them coming up and coming down and there's different mm. like, okay, so they moved and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. Um, but trying to get into the scene and imagine what is David meaning when he's saying this armor's untested? What does he mean by that? Is that what's happening? Is it a dig or is it not a dig? And how are you, how are you receiving it? There's all this interpretation that goes into it. And, and on the bell curve, we're doing it well, or we're doing it badly, but God tells us to do it. He yeah. leaves, he leaves us in the realm of the imagination yeah. for the crucifixion for Easter morning. Like, for Pentecost, for Ascension, like he leaves us in the realm of the imagination for the Exodus. Yeah, John, John, for David and, Goliath. John and Peter's race to the tomb. You know, yeah, that that's I love. One. I do love the the drop that John was faster. <laughs> like the little little trash talking. That's a track about. coach. You <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's it's all of this we have to imagine, and we're left imagining. And he wants us to imagine. That's how we're supposed to engage with it. So. You know, and we can do it well or we can do it badly. That's not to say that all bets are off. We're supposed to try to discipline our imaginations and we're supposed to stick close to what we have and work off of that and try to make it cohere and make sense. But if he gave us exact blueprints, if we had exact inspired blueprints and charts and topography maps, it would not be as potent mm. as engaging the imagination mm. with the story. Yeah. And so if it was, okay, here's your you know, David and Goliath story. This is the velocity of the stone. This is the mass of the stone. This is the trajectory of the stone. This is how much Goliath weighed that morning. This is how much weight he lost in sweat by the time they fought that day. This is how many gallons had run through the water at the bottom of the valley mm -hmm. that morning. All the specificity and the, you know, the quantification, all of that communicates less than if you actually just tell the story in the, that high level handles for the imagination way, you know, Frodo and Sam running down a hill away from the orcs. Like you tell the story like that and you have to tell the story at that level. Uh, and the imaginations are engaged. So to be scared of the imagination and the work of the imagination and think that fiction can't shape or catechize the imagination in healthy and honest and biblical ways is to just misunderstand everything about reality. I think on a fundamental level. <laughs> In conclusion, <laughs> I, I do think that's where we end. We're gonna have to punt our fear and how to use pain and fear to next. Pain episode. and fear in your parenting. Oh, great! Fantastic. Yeah. Let's do it. And uh, we'll need in episode one forty-seven because we're gonna remember all this because it doesn't amuse so. my daughter when we don't. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm trying to also remember if we've given, I think we've worked our way through most of our lamp recommendations. So we're going to need to find another we one need another people one? working on. Um, do you have one off the top? New stuff coming out? Hmm. I don't know about new. I've, uh, I'm trying to think about stuff I've been watching with my kids lately. Uh, I bounced them. I they never seen any Hogan's Heroes. So okay, that about the two that are at home, I bounced them through a little bit of Hogan's Heroes. It was like ten minutes. Mm. Then then we started the offer. Okay, uh, yeah, you because that. because it's filtered, and before we finish, we're gonna watch the Godfather. Okay, um, so we'll go through the Godfather, then we'll finish the offer, which is the making of the Godfather, and it's pretty it's pretty fantastically produced. Um, mm. And thank you, Vid Angel. Because it does, it doth need filters. <laughs> mm. Oh, doth it need it? Yes, it. Yes, it do. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, at some point, man, we got to start making money on this podcast. We got to get some official sponsorships. I think so. So sponsored by the Vid Angel. Yeah, we can either be sponsored by Vid Angel or Clearplay. I do get messages, and I do have Clearplay and Vid Angel both because the libraries. Um, I have a lot of people ask me which one's better or what to use or how I use it. I use both mm -hmm. because the libraries are different. Yeah. And um, I've found that the cost is worth it enough, you know, so it's, it's, you think about adding five bucks a month or whatever it is for these things. Then then you, you just say, okay, so for an extra a hundred bucks a year, like I open up all these li this library of narrative that I can consume and enjoy on a couch with my kids, and we can talk through and engage with. It's it really is worth it to mm -hmm. me. So there's there's a lot of things I would cut from my monthly budget before I would cut that. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Maybe we just need a new sad read section where we do an ad read. An ad? No. <laughs> no. No, but I might I might try for a filtering sponsorship. We'll see. There you go. Otherwise, we'll just be self-sponsored continuously. Oh, that's good. I mean, I don't want to get in the corporate sponsorship game, actually. But, you know, maybe a sales commission for how, for how many people get, get uh, filtering services because of us. I don't know. It'd be fun to know. I bet there's a lot. I yeah. have it, you know. I mean, we're... we're I think I've it, had Vidangel It might help us. Maybe it helps us be just totally neutral and objective by not getting anything. Just know we receive no money. From Vidangel or Clearplay. Yet. We'll see. Okay, yeah, we got to do another lamp lamp pick soon. Mm -hmm. But we're going to start doing that in a, its entirely its own siloed brand. Mm -hmm. We're going to be moving lamp off to its own. Yeah. To its own thing. So. Uh, on Canon Plus. Join Canon Plus talk. Exclusively on Canon Plus. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be creating the Looking at Moving Pictures Club as its own thing over on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, siloed over in Canon plus we'll still talk about it here obviously but yeah that's where the money's going to be so that's where you should really drop your coin right sponsor over there we need Canon plus to start filtering and throwing filtered content up mm, that's a good idea there we go let's i know who that. to ask i'll put the feature request. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do that <laughs> all righty the end peace hey christian dad are you paying a monthly fee to let Hollywood producers pump their septic tanks directly into your living room? Even worse, directly into your imagination and the imaginations of your children. How much darkness streams into your home every day, every week? Have you gotten too used to turning your mind off when you put your feet up? Have you invited your own enemies into your home? How much damage has already been done to you and to your family? My heart says that the way I feel most myself is to go by the name Fred. That's because I'm non-binary. Canon Plus is building a global platform with one simple goal, to create and deliver great content that will help Christian families grow stronger and more dangerous in the world. Content that will kick your brain's butt and help you bear down and step up. Content that will encourage, equip, educate, challenge, and inspire your family. Content built on the bedrock of real truth, real goodness, not fake trendy virtues. How dare you! And real, lasting beauty. Your family might already be struggling. Maybe the man of the house has been sipping too much Bud Light gospel in the basement for too long. It's day six of girlhood! 
but it's not too late. With thousands of audiobooks, podcasts, truth-telling documentaries, and curriculum for all ages, Canon Plus wants to help you grow stronger together with your family. There might be enemies at the gates, but there's a feast on the table to strengthen you for the fight. We want the resources we produce to help you do the real work of cultural change, becoming a lighthouse in your own community, armed with courageous joy and a faith that burns hot and bright, especially when the world would rather keep you on a cute little dimmer switch. We don't have to wallow in the world's filth. Moonlight, best picture. You ugly. We don't need to let our strength atrophy like numbed victims of some ungodly matrix, leaving our families unprotected and vulnerable. It's time for Christian fathers to stop being such cultural cuckolds, well-behaved wonderbread winners sitting by and paying for the world to assault their families with lies. Let's get strong and grow our families strong. Let's raise our kids to be the world's worst nightmares. Smart, secure, fearless, joyful, difficult to control, and quick to laugh at lies and nonsense. <laughs> We're pushing back against the rising tide of sewage on our screens. We're pumping out antidotes to the world's poisons, but we can't do it alone. We need allies. You need allies. So consider this your invitation to join up and make things a little awkward for all our weaker brethren and church leadership. It's not that we're against anything. Who so badly want to be worldly cool kids. Help us build a streaming platform unlike any other. A platform that will challenge and strengthen Christians, mind, body, and soul, until this cultural tide begins to turn. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. And yes, this tide will turn. This ain't the Alamo. We're all gonna die, but we have no intention of losing. <sighs> Canon Plus. You don't have to subscribe, but you do have to stop sucking. <laughs>